Your story belongs here. You belong here. Your story belongs here. You belong here. You belong here. <laughs> you all belong here. Dear younger me, would you ever think you'd be writing songs in college, as well as overloading on credits, and then complaining about your schedule? Dear younger me, you'll never be an engineer if that wasn't clear, you'll have a few years of doubt. Here's how they came about, dear younger me. When I was younger, I was one of those kids who was always singing and dancing. Like, I could never sit still. My parents were like, oh yeah, you're meant to be a star. And they would tell that to the family and anyone who was too close to them in the grocery store. They encouraged me to do choir and band and dance and school plays and everything to try to get my creative expression out. And they told me that those things had to be hobbies. They were extracurriculars, and when I got older, I would be able to put that aside and do something practical with my life. I followed that for a while. My confidence started withering away because I started seeing all the shortcomings I had. That dream of being an actor felt so out of reach. I would look around and I'd wouldn't see people who looked like me unless they were the punchline of a fat joke or something racist. So when I applied to colleges, I applied as a sociology major. There was a time when it was just me and my family. I was born to a Filipino-American mother from Hawaii and a black American father from DC, but I didn't know all of that yet. I knew that I liked the color red, I wanted to be a doctor or an astronaut, and I loved to read. I didn't understand things like race or gender, who was okay to love, or anything like that. I was about seven when I understood what it meant to be black for the first time. I learned about the civil rights movement in school, and I came home upset that black people had to experience these things just because of their skin color. My mom laughed with a little bit of concern and said, Kainoa, you know you're black too, right? My first year of college was rough. It kind of felt like I had shifted somehow because I always pushed myself so hard to succeed, to try to win at things. I felt like I had grown up with this responsibility to always succeed, always do well, and never accept loss in any way. And it felt like I hadn't really done anything super successful my first year of college. And to make matters worse, I ended up with COVID during the end of the school year once I felt like I was really starting to find my momentum. So no end of the year celebrations, no last goodbyes to friends I might never see again that were graduating and I had to do all of my finals in my room by myself while quarantined. When I was younger, my mother and female role models guided how I viewed everything. Growing up, I would go with her everywhere. We would get groceries, go to Macy's to get a nice dress. I would be with her at the salon, soaking my feet in a nice comfy chair. One day my mother told me that we were being watched all the time that people were judging me before they even knew me, that there were stereotypes being placed upon me that I, I was just starting to know about. And she didn't want those stereotypes to be placed upon me. And so she guided me on how to fit in in society and not dress like a Bama. She taught me how to dress, how to smell good cologne, how to do my hair, and this was when I was eight years old. And I, and I still do care about this, but back then, I didn't care about it for myself. I cared about it because I didn't want to be perceived negatively. I also didn't really do the traditional masculine things. I liked reading, I hated physical fitness. And even though I played with the guys, I liked sitting down and talking with girls because I didn't feel judged. I felt comfortable. 
Once upon a time, freshman year high school, I was part of a friend group and we would hang out during our classes, clubs, and lunch periods we happened to share. For a while, things seemed perfect. However, I soon started to notice things and feel as if I wasn't really part of the group. I was feeling left out by my friends. When COVID all started, I graduated from high school. I also decided to move to South Korea with my family and take classes online. To be honest, it was a rough year, physically and mentally. I was devouring coffee to avoid sleep, surviving from 13 hour minimum and 14 hour maximum time differences, depending on the daylight savings. I was doing an internship, so I went to bed around 3 a.m. and woke up at 8 a.m. in the morning. I was so sleep deprived, I was mentally drained. I remember when I first walked into my kindergarten classroom, I didn't notice anybody that looked like me. And honestly, I was relieved that nobody else's mom had decided to put their child's hair in a mohawk with Afro puffs or decided to wear red converses. <laughs> this was because I knew I looked fly and I wanted to stand out. I sat down and I started to take in my new environment. I noticed that my new classroom smelled like Clorox and there was a toy box in every single corner. <laughs> Once I started to observe different things, I had diverted my attention to the dry erase board at the front of the room when I felt a tug on one of my pups. I turned around and I saw two girls standing over me with my pup still clasped in her hand. One of them had asked me, why is your hair so spirally. Why is it so oily? I mean, it looks like cheese puffs. This is a story about a time where I discovered the pressures and benefits of living away from home. I committed to UMBC without visiting the campus because it was during the pandemic. So I was like, is everything going to fit in the room? Am I going to like the vibe? How's the faculty, the amenities, the resources, the physical campus? Like it was a lot going on in my head. When I applied to colleges, I applied as a sociology major. I was planning on just doing theater for fun. So I asked if it was okay for non-majors to take theater classes. And I was invited to the theater department meeting before the first day of school. And the rest, as they say, is history. I changed my major and I got accepted into the BFA program. And I decided to disappoint my parents with my whole chest. Kainoa, you know you're black too, right? My mom always told me, never turn your back to the ocean because the ocean is powerful and meant to be respected. At this moment, it felt like a wave had washed on me from behind, filling my mouth and nose with salty water. In an instant, hundreds of years of oppression and brutality became mine to carry. Then things started to get more complicated. I knew that my dad was black and I was just like him and my grandparents, but my mom and none of my family on her side were. And then questions started to come in from kids at school. Why is your mom so much lighter than you? Why is your dad so much darker than you? Where are you from? No, where are you really from? So I went home and asked her, where are we from? She laughed. I'm from Hawaii, but you're from Maryland. Okay, so we're Hawaiian. She laughed a little harder. No, my mom is Filipino and my dad is white. I'm from Hawaii, but I'm not native Hawaiian. I tried to explain this to kids at school. Oh, so you're mixed. Okay, so you're Blasian, like black and Asian. I grew and I started to understand more of my identity. And the more I learned about myself, the more I found myself in the middle of so many areas. If you are both this and that, is there anywhere where you really just are. And even though I played with the guys, I liked sitting down and talking with girls because I didn't feel judged. I felt comfortable. That comfort started to shift when I got into high school though. Even though we all wore a uniform, most guys were wrinkled, whereas I kept mine nice and pressed. That coupled with the way I act led a lot of people to assume that I was gay. And I would always tell them, no, I'm not. But the assumptions persisted. But it was when my mother and sister started to question my sexuality that I started to question everything that I was taught growing up. I grew up around women going shopping, seeing them get their nails done, so I didn't question 
when I asked my mother to pierce my ear or paint my nails. I just thought it was stylish. I mean, it looks like cheese puffs. I was really taken aback because I didn't think that anything was wrong. I didn't have a problem with my hair because in my Liberian household, my hair in its most natural state was something to be celebrated. I looked forward to spending hours at the salon or between my mom's knees as she would braid my hair in intricate cornrow designs that fell to my shoulders. When I would debut a new hairstyle at school, I was excited to show my friends, but my friends and my classmates would ask me if my hair was real. Yet, when I would blow dry my hair straight, oh, everybody was in awe. And I couldn't help but notice the difference in how I was treated when I had my hair curly versus when it was straight. I just couldn't help but feel, what's the point of having long hair if I couldn't wear it straight like everybody else at school? Eventually, I had convinced my mom to allow me to relax all 24 inches of my natural hair. My hair's character, volume, and ultimately my personality had all flatlined as it lay straight against my back. Void of its texture, I had ultimately allowed myself to sanitize my blackness. I felt okay with this because I fit in. However, I had taken away the one thing about me that I had loved so much and cared for. I was mentally drained. I didn't have time to talk or have a phone call or hang out with my friends. All I could do was talking to my family, but it was not enough. Our lifestyles were totally different. I couldn't really talk to them. So that was the time I felt I was alone, all alone. One day, I decided to go for a walk. It was my only escape from reality. The resources, the physical campus, like it was a lot going on in my head. So now come move-in day, August 29th, my slot was from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. I'm supposed to leave my house like 9 to make it here on time, and I woke up at 8.45. I was like, Shit. So now I'm throwing everything inside my car, like, Mom, like, we got to go. We get to UMBC. There's so much traffic on the exit. And then I get to the Erickson desk. The desk attendant was, like, super helpful, like, letting me know, like, you're okay. Like, you're fine. Just come on in. Like, settle in. So now, like, we moved in, and... I'm like, let's go turn the campus a little. Let me walk around and try to make connections. I walked around for three hours and did not say hi to anybody. So I went back to my room. I decided to go on Instagram. During the pandemic, there was like a UMBC 2024 like group chat and I met like a lot of mutuals. And this girl, let's call her Mona. She texted me about a couple weeks before moving telling me how her birthday was coming up and she wanted to get to know each other. And I didn't respond, not because I was trying to be rude, but I was just like nervous, like eventually I'm gonna have to see them in prison. So like, how do I respond to them and stuff? And so I just decided to text her. I was like, hey Mona, I just checked in. Like, I'm doing any help settling in. She was like, oh my God, yes, come to my room. So I was like, oh yeah, this is exciting. Like I go to her room and we were just talking for hours about anything and everything, like boys, school. And she lived on campus before. So she was giving me like a lot of advice. We did not unpack anything. Sat there for hours just talking. I was really happy because I finally like made a connection. I kind of like took a leap of faith and it paid off. I had to do all of my finals in my room by myself while quarantined. Summer came around after this. I had decided that I would audition for the community theater group that I worked with in Catonsville, Star. And I was given a role that really let me do my best to break out of my shell. But I still felt as if I had kind of lost that spark I used to have for acting and performing and making art. One day after one of the shows, one of the directors who I had considered a mentor, a role model, and almost a second parent of sorts, pulled me aside and said that she realized how much I had been working and she wanted me to come back the next year to assistant direct a show for her and at a different moment had called me and one of my other friends the heart and the soul of the program. I hadn't heard that from someone in a very long time and it flipped this switch for me and suddenly I had more of a drive to keep working and really make something that people would remember. It was so important to me in that moment to have these mentors here. I really needed to be reminded that there are people that are rooting for me. I felt my confidence slowly rise from the ashes because I realized I spent so much time in my life making myself smaller and quieter and 
by the time I got to my junior year, I was starting to see some of my confidence come back and feel better about my abilities to be an actor. But then I had a really difficult challenge ahead of me because I found out that Girls on a Dirt Pile would be produced next year. And I was so excited to read the rough draft of it. I fell so in love with the story, the characters, the world of the play, everything. It was one of those things that called me so strongly. I felt like I had to be a part of the story. So if you are both this and that, is there anywhere where you really just are? Then in 2016, I joined the Students for Social Justice Club at my high school. I learned about intersectionality, coined by civil rights activist and critical race theorist Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. Intersectionality is defined as how all of our identities and our existence on margins and areas of privilege inform the way that we move through space and society. I learned that I could be Black, Filipino, queer, all at the same time. That felt really good. I just thought it was stylish. I didn't want to get rid of what made me me, my emotions, my thoughts, because then what would I have left? I had to accept the parts of me that I was told were weak, that I was told to get away from. Instead of conforming to this one view of being a man, I allowed my emotions to make my relationships stronger and deeper. And that made me whole. I'm a man, I love fruity cocktails, fishing, and making myself look good. There's no one way to be a person because our potential is infinite. I had taken away the one thing about me that I had loved so much and cared for. With the rise, however, of the natural hair movement, I soon gained the confidence to ultimately big chop, as it said in the natural hair community, 14 inches of my hair. I started to realize that the bigger my fro, the bigger my power. I finally was able to gain touch with this part of myself again. Arriving at UMBC, I was surprised to find a community like Curl Power. Curl Power is a student organization here at UMBC that is devoted to women of color, specifically black or African American women, and we're united through our shared experiences with our hair. The women there are learning that we are important members of society and that we're beautiful just the way we are. I never thought that I would find this community at UMBC, but I'm so glad that I did. Now I know I don't need to change to fit in. I was born to stand out, and I will never apologize for that. One day, I decided to go for a walk. I went to the capital of South Korea, Seoul. It started as usual, and suddenly, the cloudy sky turned into a pitch black, dark sky. The lightnings and thunderstorms were striking. I got drenched. I was shivering from the cold, but somehow it was the most tranquil moment I've ever experienced. It was so calm. And I realized that moment that maybe being alone is not a bad thing. That made me think about my freshman year. I realized I was just experiencing the crisis that every young adults go through. My freshman year is just my opportunity to get to know about myself. I like walking while watching a sunset. I like indie music compared to pop music. And I like to think. After finishing my freshman year, I left South Korea and came back to Maryland. I had to figure out a lot of stuff by myself, but I'm not anxious anymore about being alone. I learned my lesson from the rain and from my walk. I was really happy because I finally like made a connection. I kind of like took a leap of faith and it paid off. Afterwards, she introduced me to a bunch of people. I like attended events for like student organizations. I went to a couple like ASA meetings, BSU meetings, the Association for Black Artists meetings, a Muslim Student Association meetings, and it kind of allowed me to like branch out. So I made connections with people there who introduced me to other people to other people and that's kind of how like I built like my network and I ended up like making more and more connections even with individuals who didn't necessarily run in the same circles that I do so although like moving on campus was like kind of scary kind of exciting at the same time for me stepping out in the unknown was really 
why I feel comfortable and why I feel like I'm at home at UMBC. Sometimes it just takes like a little act of courage, like a DM to like change your whole experience around. Be comfortable with the uncomfortable. I finished this show with more confidence than I had felt in myself in a really long time. And I feel like I really just can't accurately describe how much that meant to me. And I just hope that other people hearing this can realize that as much as we think we're always alone, there are usually almost always people watching out for us, people who want us to do our best, who are just happy when we try and when we succeed and are willing to celebrate with us. I came to dread going to school. It was all so tough to deal with, but somehow I got through it. I think over time we got used to the fact that our relationship had changed and things were able to start getting better. We were able to interact civilly, not exactly forget the past or become friends again, but we could come together and achieve things, you know, when the class or club called for it. I realize now that my friends and I, we had to go through this. We had to break apart in order for me to build up the emotional intelligence skills and communication skills I understandably lacked <laughs> as a child. This story will always be something difficult for me to talk about because I will always feel ashamed of the way that I also hurt them during this time. You know, I wasn't always a victim. However, I will always be grateful for the lessons I've learned, the growing I've done on my path towards maturity, towards learning how to find where I belong, learning how to recognize my worth and to choose my worth, especially in situations that seek to challenge it. There's no one way to be a person because our potential is infinite. I know that you must be scared. You're in a new environment, but everybody else is in that same situation. Bond through the experience. Embrace the fear, embrace the unknown, and embrace what makes you you. And find people who will embrace you too. And get at least one person's number today, or their Instagram, if you don't like giving out your personal info. That's cool. I learned that I could be black, Filipino, queer, all at the same time. That felt really good. I came to college and I joined organizations like the Filipino American Student Association and I got to learn more about my identities in a way that I never had before. So where does that leave me? What happened to that boy who was set adrift in an ocean surrounded by islands that felt like home but we're just out of reach, being washed over and over from all directions by waves of oppression and impositions of how I was supposed to be. I built bridges and I created a place for myself where I was connected to all of these things at once. I am black, I am Filipino, I'm American, I'm bisexual, I'm all of these things at the same time. And I'm also so much more than that. I'm an actor, I'm a musician, I'm a dancer, I am a friend, a student, a teacher. All of these identities I wear proudly. I'm here taking up space in all of these ways and I deserve to be here. Don't ever let anybody tell you how to define yourself or how to box yourself in. Figure out what works for you and take up that space because you belong here. Cause right now I'm fighting with a slight chance to succeed. We keep on trying, soon you'll be flying. Some people around will try and dissuade you, but trust me when I say they'll make you stronger. Push a little farther. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can never stop you. Friends and family by your side were there to help you fly, dear younger me. Just wait and see. The joy a couple of songs can bring Dear younger me You'll be a musical playwright I felt like I had to be a part of this story. When auditions rolled around, I was so determined to prove myself. When callbacks came around, I felt a lot less confident about that. We were told that 
the show would be very physically challenging. When I saw the other bodies in the room that I was comparing myself to, I was not confident that I would be cast. But I was. <laughs> I was shocked, excited. I did my summer workout program with all the other actors and I came to the first day of rehearsal stronger than I was before. Yeah, rehearsals were tough and they were really hard, but it was worth it. I wouldn't want to work that hard for anything else. We found out that we were going to perform at the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival. <laughs> it felt like all of our blood, sweat, and tears were finally validated, and we would be able to share that story with so many people. So we were so excited. We packed up everything, threw it into some trucks. We head down to DC. The day before we were supposed to perform, we had to put everything back together piece by piece. As I was filling the middle part of the set with the little rubber pieces of dirt that we had, I was looking around and just admiring the beautiful newfound family that we created. There were electricians, you know, furiously focusing lights. I could hear the sound of all the power tools. I felt at home and I felt like I really belonged. When we performed the next day, I had this like, elated, tingly feeling inside that I can't even explain, but we were able to support each other through all the training and the learning, and now here we were doing the thing we loved together off campus for the first time. Now all of us are in professional productions in Baltimore and D.C., still doing our thing together. Your dreams are possible, and they can come true. You just need the support system that you'll find here to be able to do it.